Good morning. I'm Mike Martin. I'm involved here in the men's ministry. Uh, today's passage is from Nehemiah 5, 1 through 9. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may keep, eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, and it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself and brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, and you, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not say, find a word to say. So I said, the thing you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Mike. Well, my name is Zach Thompson. I'm on staff here at Calvary Bible Church, and uh, I'm so excited to continue our series through the book of ne uh, Nehemiah with you all. And if, if you're sitting here thinking, oh, I haven't been part of this series uh, at all so far, that's totally fine. Neither have I. Uh, just really grateful for the generosity of Calvary Bible Church to be able to take the last four weeks, and it's weird to say that out loud, the last four Sundays I've not been up here with you all uh, so that I could be with Emily and our newborn son. Really appreciate your generosity, your prayers as, as we have get, uh, get to experience this time together as a family. But as I said, we are continuing the series in Nehemiah, and, and I want to help us to see where this story fits into God's story, into the Bible. And so I want to recap for us if this, new, if this is a new story for us, then I want to cap this story for us to help us to see where it fits in the Bible. What we see is that God, throughout the Old Testament, has been telling his people, I have been faithful to you. He's been showing his people, I have been faithful to you. He has been working for his people just so that they could see that he is being faithful to them. He's given them ample reasons to be faithful to God in return. But he gives them a warning. He says that if you are not faithful, then you will be punished. And this is not retaliation or revenge or they caught God on a bad day. The purpose of this punishment is to see their dependency on God to see what God has done for them, for them to turn and be faithful as well. And what we see is Israel continues to rebel and they turn away from God. And so God allows them to be conquered and taken off into exile. The, the story of Nehemiah picks up um, where Israel uh, is starting to return to Jerusalem. God's people, the Jews, are starting to go back to their nation. And, and they're doing so so that they can rebuild the city. Conquered cities tend to not be left in the best of shape, and so they're rebuilding the city. But they're also returning to Jerusalem to be rebuilt, to be renewed as the people of God. This is a great book for us to be going through. I hope you've seen that over the last couple of weeks to, to where it really applies to our situation. How do we be faithful to God? How do we remember to turn to him rather than away from him? How do we respond to leaders and difficulty? Uh, how do we work within the various fields that he has us in? How do we work together? There, there's so much that applies to us as a church here that comes from the book of Nehemiah. But I so appreciate how our passage today relates to this event that we're doing. Brody talked uh, before that this weekend is, is a time that we set aside to look at the 6-8 project. And the naming of that comes from a different place in the Old Testament, from a different book of the Old Testament called Micah. In Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, Micah 6, 8, it says this. He says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? So what does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, 
and to walk humbly with your God. And so we set this time aside, we take this Sunday where we keep talking about the 6-8 project so that this becomes part of our DNA. We want to be people who value what God's values. We, we want to be people who do what God has called us to do. And what does he require of you? To do justice, to love kindness. Another word for that is mercy, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. As we look at our passage today out of Nehemiah chapter five and chapter six, well, wouldn't you know it? It's about justice, it's about mercy, and it's about humility. These chapters kind of work as a, a change in what we've seen so far. Uh, as we said, so much of, of what's come before is about rebuilding the city, but now the focus is on how do we rebuild the people? I mean, after all, the reason why Jerusalem is in ruins, the reason why Jerusalem is broken is because the people were broken. And all the work that they could do to rebuild walls, that's, that won't help if they continue to ignore what God has called them to do. And the people are ignoring what God has called them to do. So we pick up these chapters that are so focused on mercy and justice and the kind of the first movement of the story uh, is, is coming from those verses that were just read for us that talk about mercy and justice within the people of God. Mercy and justice within the people of God. Because we're told of three situations that are going on, three circumstances that many of the Jews find themselves going through. They, there's not enough to eat. Many are mortgaging their land to, to pay for basic needs. And others are having to sell their kids into slavery to pay off debts. This is all happening in what we might say is kind of a perfect storm of awfulness. There's so many circumstances that are weighing on Jerusalem that's leading to them to respond in this way. First and foremost, there's a famine that's gone through the land, and that makes food scarce to begin with. But then we also think about last week where we were looking at all of the people in Jerusalem are working to rebuild the city. You have some who are working directly on the wall, others who are working to guard the city, even others who are doing both at the same time. There's people carrying things while having a sword on them. And when they're working in this way, that means that they're not working in another way. In their jobs, the things that they rely on for income to, to meet the needs of their household, they're not able to do that because they are carrying and rebuilding the city. And so that makes it hard to survive, to meet basic needs. But more than that, they are under severe taxation. Israel was, was carted off, they went into exile, and they were uh, freed from their, their exile in Babylon by Persia. Persia conquered Babylon, allowed the, the Jews to go back home, and they said, you are more than welcome to go home, we're just gonna tax you like crazy to do so. And so the, the tax rates are incredibly high, they're already not working, so the, they have other Jewish people come up to them, their, their countrymen, and say, hey, we can lend you the money at exorbitant interest rates. So all of this is working out to make things so difficult for them. And, and we look at this situation, and I, don't, I, I, I think most of us, most people would see this and say, this is a really bad situation. People who are suffering while others have plenty, people who are looking to rebuild the community as, as, a, as a whole group, but are going through difficulty individually, having to sell your children into slavery to pay off your interest payments only. This is a terrible situation. But it goes beyond that. Because when we look at something and we say it's bad, it might just be how we feel about a situation or, or what we think about it. But by its very nature, the practices that, that the Jewish people are doing to their fellow Jewish people are wrong. Nehemiah says that. What you are doing is wrong, not based off his feeling, but by God's unchanging law. Because God has specifically said not to do these very things. Uh, turn with me or follow along on the, uh, the screen to uh, the book of Leviticus. So in Leviticus, you have all of these laws that are given to the people of God on how they are to be the people of God. And, and we might read this, this book and it's like, oh, it's just laws, it's do this, don't do this. But the reason why God gives these laws is so that they could reflect who he is. They could reflect his character to the world. And one of the main ways that God gives instruction to his people is on caring for one another. As God is one who cares, here's how you are to care for the people of God. 
And this is what we pick up with in Leviticus 25, verse 35. It says, if your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You should not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. If we skip down just one verse to verse 39, it continues. It says, and if your brother becomes poor beside you and he sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and a sojourner. He shall be with you until until the year of Jubilee, a time of uh, releasing people, giving people freedom, and releasing people of their debts. But in the midst of this, we see some basic principles that if you see someone suffering next to you, you support them. And you don't do so by charging them interest. And you definitely don't sell your fellow countrymen into slavery. But it's not just this list of instructions. It's not, uh, here's how you need to behave. So work really hard to do this. When we talk about how God calls for us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God, the, the, this isn't the times that we go, yeah, let's all walk out of here and try really, really hard to do those things. We are always told why why this is required, why this is given by God. And that's true here as well, because I skipped a verse in there. We skipped verse 38, which shows us why the people of God are to act in this way. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and gave you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So what God says in this time is, I have been merciful to you, so you are to show mercy to others. I have done what's good for you, so you are to seek to do good for others. I've done what's right by you, so you are to do what's right, to do what's just towards others. I have brought you together to be a people. Nothing you did earned this. I've brought you together to be a people so you are to treat each other with the value and dignity and worth that I put into each and every one of you. Because of what I have done, you are to treat one another in this way. And that's not what the Israelites are doing in the book of Nehemiah. They're completely going against God in everything that he said to do. And Nehemiah responds to it. And and I think that there's something that we can learn as people who see injustices, people who see others suffering, people who see uh, others exploited. I think there's something in Nehemiah's response that we can learn from of how do we respond in those situations? How do we respond to injustice? How do we respond to suffering, to hardship, to difficulty? Well, the first thing that we see in Nehemiah's response is that he gets angry. He sees what's going on and it says, I uh, was angry. Many of the commentators that I was consulting for this spend page after page in their book or uh, a great number of minutes in their talks uh, going back and forth. Is this righteous anger? Is he acting sinful? Was it okay for him to do this? What other response is there? He's seen people made in the image of God exploited to go through difficulty, to be pressed down so others can be lifted up. The only appropriate response to seeing this sort of action, to seeing injustice, is anger. The great medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas put it this way. He said, if you can live amid injustice without anger, you are immoral as well as unjust. We should be angry when we see things going contrary to God's plan and what he's called for us to do, especially within the people of God. Now, what's important is Nehemiah doesn't just react out of his anger. He gets angry, which which is the right response, but he doesn't just retaliate or act out of that anger because the second part of his response is he takes counsel. It says that I took counsel with myself. So often we, or maybe, maybe others don't do this, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. So often I move from uh, I am angry to now I'm yelling about what made me angry without anything in between. And the problem with that is if we aren't pausing, if we aren't taking counsel, if we aren't coming up with a plan to address what's wrong, then there's nothing being done to make it right. If all we're doing is responding to what made us angry, we're just looking to make ourselves feel better. I'm just looking to resolve my anger. As I'm shouting, that makes me feel better, but it does nothing to address the situation that made us angry in the first place. 
That cannot be the way that we respond to injustice here, just reacting out of our anger. We pause, we take counsel. And Nehemiah then, after that pause, takes action. He comes up with a plan. So often people who are exploited or abused don't have a voice, but Nehemiah did. And maybe you do as well. He sees injustice and he speaks up into that situation. This is Nehemiah 5, verse 9. It says, So I said, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? What you are doing is not good. He speaks up into the situation. What you are doing is not good. He tells them that the the process that they're on is the wrong thing to do. He shows them the injustice of the situation and not just retaliating, not just shouting, but saying, this is wrong. We are gonna put a place in a thing to make things right. We see injustice. We are gonna respond to this by uh, bringing about justice instead. And again, he tells us why this is the case. It's not go work harder to be better. He tells us why we act in this way. It is rooted in the fear of our God. Ought you not walk in the fear of our God? I mean, shouldn't we follow what God has for us rather than trying to amass more and more for ourselves even at the expense of other people? Shouldn't we obey God rather than trying to force this life to obey our needs, our demands, our calls? Shouldn't we look to the one who has full control over everything rather than trying to hold on to some modicum of control that we think we have? Ought we not walk in the fear of our God? As we see who he is, the reverence that we have, the respect, the awe we have for God because we see how good he is, we see what he's done for us, we see how holy he is, we see how loving he is, that is what shapes us to live in this way. That is what shapes us to seek mercy and justice within the people of God. So Nehemiah says, here's the plan. We're gonna give it all back. We exploited people. We made profit off of them. We've gone against what God has said, so we're gonna give everything back. That's Nehemiah's response. And the people's response is, yes, we will do this. We're gonna make a promise. We're gonna do exactly what you said. That's a costly repentance, to give everything back. So they, they had plans in place. They, they lent out money with extremely high interest rates, so, so they were gonna make a lot of money off of this. All that's gone. But not just that, the money that they lent, that's gone as well. That's already been spent. That went to pay taxes. That went to buy food. So you're not even getting your original investment back, but you are also losing any potential gains that you could have had. That is a costly repentance. And yet they say the call that God has for us is greater than anything else. Do we recognize the same thing? The call that God has for us to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly, that that is greater than anything we might gain or lose in this world. Do we, as the people of God, as a small piece of the people of God in this church, Do we look around and see, are there injustices? Are people being exploited? Are there others around me who are suffering when I have more? One of the strengths of the evangelical church is on a focus on individual, personal relationship with Jesus, that that personal spiritual growth that we have. And that is a really good thing to focus on. We should never lose that. The difficulty comes when you're in an individualistic culture like ours, to where the focus shifts from the collective we of a church to just on ourselves. I mean, how often does this show up in our Bible reading as well? We read about what Jesus does for the church and we read it just about what Jesus has done for us, which is true, Jesus has done that for you, don't don't lose that part. But we ignore everyone else around us that Jesus has done that same thing for or the one another's in the Bible. We, we are called to love one another, and the, our thoughts go to, yeah, I'm so excited to be loved by other people. Okay, great, but what are you doing to love one another? 
How often do we think about or hear or, or even feel, okay, but what about mine? Or when we see other people suffering around us, our thought goes to, well, if they just worked as hard as I did, things would be fine. Or when there's a sacrifice that comes from being in community with other people, we instead go, well, but what about my freedoms or what's due to me? See, in the times that our focus goes more to our thoughts, our felt needs, our wants, and our time schedule, we miss out on the people that Jesus felt was so worthy that he paid for them by his blood. And we miss out on what God calls his people to do. Maybe it's just because I haven't had anything else on my mind lately, but I've been spending a lot of time with someone extremely selfish. He wants what he wants when he wants it. I mean, who cares about other people's schedules or their needs or their sleep? Now, we think that that's fine for Everett because he's four weeks old, but that's not fine for the people of God. And again, we are told the reason why. Because this is the people of God. This is who God has made his, that he has cared for, that he has provided for, that he has been faithful to. And so when we gather together, yes, there are sacrifices and that, that hurts. There are things that we could do that would benefit us. Otherwise, if we didn't have to make the sacrifice, there, there's, there's slights against us, there's loss, there's, there's hurts that come from being in community. And yet what we see is God brings people together that is for our benefit and theirs, that what we receive, the blessings we receive in his people greatly outweighs anything else. So we pursue mercy and justice within the people of God. Second thing from this passage is that we see mercy and justice act as evangelism, of telling others about who God is. And again, this comes from the verse that we read earlier, verse nine. It says, so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? So ought you not to walk in the fear of God? Ought we not live in light of all that God has done, all that God is, all that uh, God's faithfulness to us? Ought we not, not live in response to all that for the purpose of to prevent the taunts of our enemies? The idea is that how we relate to each other inside the church impacts people who are outside the church. That the mercy and justice that we demonstrate here helps people understand the goodness of God outside of the church. This is a negative way of putting it, that if we are not merciful, if we are not just towards each other, then yeah, people outside are gonna taunt us. They're gonna look down on us. Jesus, however, puts this positively. The same idea he puts positively in John uh, 13, 35. He says, and by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, by if you wear a cross necklace, by if you vote in a certain way, by if you announce it on social media, by if you just loudly shout to people that you are Christian. It's none of those things. By this, people will know that you are my disciples, that you are my follower, is how you love by how you love one another. The idea is how we treat each other in here, in the church, in Christian relationships, within the people of God, that helps people outside of the church to know who God is. And we might think, well, what do I care what people think about me? Okay, but these passages are talking about what we do creates thoughts about God in other people. And we should care about what people think about God since we have been tasked to make his name and his glory known to all the nations. Mercy and justice are ways that God can and has used to, make, uh, to bring people close to himself. So we seek to live in this way within the church. Third, we see in this passage that it's uh, mercy and justice that's offered for others as well. That's not just how we treat each other, that, that when people are suffering out the outside the church, then, oh, if you just join our church, then we, we can show you mercy then. No, we indiscriminately offer mercy and justice for all people without reservation. This is verse 17. It says, moreover, there were at my table, Nehemiah's table, 150 men, 
Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. A little bit of catch up to get to, get to this point. It tells us that Nehemiah is made governor over this area. So he is a, kind of the political uh, overseer of, of all the Jewish people in the area. And as his right, as governor, he can collect kind of like a tax, food and cattle and things to provide for himself. He, he's in a position of authority. Uh, he is do something for being in that position. But he says, I didn't do any of that. Especially after we just saw these, these passages of exploitation, of people going uh, above and beyond to push others down, to elevate himself. He said, I collected nothing. I didn't insist upon what was due to me. I didn't demand others give me what was mine by right. I ignored that and I showed mercy instead. I paid for myself on my own dime. But not just that, he has these people around him, people he's responsible for, that he chooses to care for again out of his own pocket. 150 men are there. There's Jewish leaders, there's officials, these are probably Persian people who are there to, to help oversee the building uh, of this, the rebuilding of the city. But it also says this, those who came to us from the nations that are around us. Now, if you've been tracking in the story of Nehemiah, we, we see the, the people around Jerusalem respond in exactly one way, unjustly. They've lied about the Jews. They, they've uh, uh, gone against the Jews. They, they uh, told uh, the, le- uh, the Persian king that, that they're seeking to rebel against you, so you get, should get them to stop rebuilding their city. When the king said, all right, I believe your lie, uh, he didn't say that exactly like that, but in a sense, he believed their lie. They went and they destroyed the city all over again. And yet those are the people that Nehemiah invites to his table. If there's anyone who did not deserve mercy, It would be them. But what Nehemiah shows us is that mercy is never something that's earned. That we don't withhold justice until someone proves that they deserve it to us. We indiscriminately give mercy and justice to all people, whether they come to church or not, whether they might believe or not, we demonstrate mercy and justice to all. And I really hope I'm being annoying in how consistent I am in going back to this, we're told the reason why. Because of the fear of God. Nehemiah says, I acted in this way because of the fear of God. Which segues into my last point. And it needs to be a quick point because it comes from all of chapter six. I need to summarize that in like two paragraphs here. Uh, but the, the final point gets to, we've been looking at God's people are called to lo- do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. But what about in times when we are going through something unfair? What about when people aren't just to us? What about when people aren't being merciful to us? How do we respond in that situation? And this is what we see in chapter six. The the enemies, those who are outside the city, those, some of those who Nehemiah invited to his table, look and see, well, Jerusalem's almost rebuilt. The walls are almost up. So they put plans in place, three plans in place to stop the rebuilding of the city. More specifically, to remove Nehemiah as a threat. First, they plan to attack him. They put a plan in place to attack him. Three, three times, four times, multiple times, they invite Nehemiah to come out of the city for a little parlay. We can discuss terms. It'll be beneficial for both of our people. And yet it actually says that they did so with intent to harm him. But Nehemiah does not fall for the trick. I think the giveaway, it says that they wanted to invite him to come to the Valley of Ono. Uh, I think if you're ever invited to a place that's called Oh No, it, that's, there's a warning in there for you. But the second plan that they put in place is they looked to, or they accused him. They made up lies about him. They write this open letter and they send it out so all the people can see saying, well, the Jews are just going to rebel against the king. King should probably do something about that. I mean, that lie worked in the past. They got to destroy the city all over again. So they try their trick, but it doesn't work. So they put in place their third unjust, immoral, unmerciful response, and they look to profane Nehemiah. We're told of someone within the city from the context clues that we put together. uh, He was probably either a former priest or a former prophet, but he he invites Nehemiah over and he tells him, I I know they're gonna come for you tonight. They're gonna look to kill you. 
And unless if you hide, unless if you make yourself safe and secure, and, and, the, and the best place for that is the temple, if you go in there, lock the doors, that's the only place that you will be safe. Otherwise, they're going to kill you tonight. And we might think, that, that doesn't sound unjust. Like, that sounds really nice. Thank you for this warning. Only priests were allowed into the temple. Nehemiah is not a priest. And even in his response, he sees through what, is, what this man is saying to him. He's trying to get him to sin. He's trying to get him to fear for his life rather than fear God. See, in all of this, when facing the, this attack, this, accuse, uh, this accusation, this uh, profaning against him, Nehemiah is calm. He's level-headed. He, he sticks to what's true. He never wavers from that, but he doesn't retaliate He doesn't insist upon what's due. He doesn't yell or scream. He is completely unmoved in all of this. And how is that possible? Well, he trusts in the promises of his his God. He knows who his God is, so he is unwavering, unshakable, even in the face of severe injustice and a lack of mercy from others. That is what enables him to live in response to God because he knows who his God is.